It's time for a new perspective with your host, Pastor Mike Sherbino, with your daily dose of how much Jesus is with us. If you're ready for some inspiration and help getting through these tough times, then listen in today as Mike interviews a whole host of people from all walks of life, thought leaders, seekers, and followers, all to hear God's voice who speaks in all languages. So sit back and relax, and don't worry, this isn't a show about what you need to do to be loved by God. It's a show about about a whole lot of good news. From a mighty church just outside of Toronto, here's Mike Sherbineau. When I say the word peace, what comes to mind? I remember about a year ago, we were in a small boat, my wife and I, terrific storm was building. We couldn't get back to the shore fast enough. And just as we landed, torrential rain came down. There was eventually a power blackout for five days. But my mind flashes back to the day when Jesus was on the Sea of Galilee and there was a storm and the disciples said, Lord, don't you care that we perish? Mm. And Jesus said, peace, be still. He said to the storm, peace. And Mitch, peace is huge in people's lives. Absolutely. We want peace. We want that from the calamity that's around us to whatever it is, the inner thing that we are fighting with. We want mm -hmm. peace, don't we? Yeah, and Mike, I think society is always pulling us in different directions, saying you have to go get a degree, you have to get this job, make this much money, have these relationships. And as these different pressures and expectations are piled on us, I'm left wondering, like a lot of people, how can we find peace? You know, we have, I think, one of my most favorite couples uh, on the program today. We have Squire Rushnell and we have Louise Duarte, and they're with us. And, you know, not only do the have developed the whole thing of helping us to see God winks, that mm -hmm. whole analogy. And the books that they've written are amazing. They're also uh, producers, they've been entertainers, so much we could say about them, but they're gonna help us unpack peace because they also have a huge initiative to help people pray. And we're gonna talk with them awesome. right now. Squire and Louise, so glad you're back with us. I almost feel like we should be on the other side of the camera. You should just run the program for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd have to be here on Martha's Vineyard, That's Mike. That's right. And gosh, well, we, not so bad. we can work that out. Yes, Mitch, <laughs> you could be here. <laughs> okay, well, let's, uh, we'll talk right after the program. Uh, but hey, you know what? Every time I see you, it feels like there has been a gap of time in between and stuff happens in our personal lives. We see it politically. We see it in the world. Um, here's a question about, as we're talking about peace today. Should we be putting blinders on amid all the chaos? Because it can just trickle into our life and cause us to go septic. Do we just ignore it? Or how do we deal with it? Talk to mm. me about that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because we lived in New York for quite a few years and right by Central Park. Yeah. And um, I used to see the horse with the blinders on. And I, I, said, I feel that way yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And I said to Square, yeah. why did they put the blinders on the horse? horses yeah. and and then we did some research it's because they don't want the horses looking to the left or looking to the right they'll get spooked because they have a destination that they have to go to a finish line so to speak and the only way to do that is to head straight for where that finish line is and and i think in our lives as christians we need spiritual blinders because there's so many things that are pulling us as you said, Michael, with well, the political stuff and, and then the health issues, the uncertainty everyone has. To Instead of looking at that, God wants us to look towards Jesus, head for the light. So we need to, I kind of do that a lot, is just say, I'm going to put my spiritual blinders on and I'm not going to go there. I'm going to just mm. focus on Jesus. That's where my destination well, is. Well, think about who wants you to look away who wants to distract yeah. you, disorient you. It is the dis of darkness, Satan. And mm -hmm. I keep thinking about that, um, that wonderful quote in Hebrew, that we must always persevere and fix our eyes mm -hmm. on the future, where we're going, and run that race mm -hmm. with Jesus. Well, Squire, That's all let we me have to do, run Oops. the race with Jesus. Right on. Well, Squire, let me ask you a question based on that. Uh, you know, you're referencing the Bible. In the Bible, we're told that as people who follow Jesus, there's a couple things you have to watch out for. One of them is Satan, but one of them is the world. And so let me ask you, thinking about culture, uh, society, when we're thinking about spiritual blinders, what sort of things are the world and society throwing at us that are going to distract us and cause us to worry? 
Well, my goodness, we there's a new crisis every day on the news, and we're not even sure if we can believe the news. We don't know what news to believe. The, and, uh, and everything, it seems, is in a big cauldron that, mm. that, that uh, Satan is stirring all the time, trying to uh, get us off our game, get us off our mark, get us off our focus. And all the time, just like Louise said, I think we have to spiritually put our blinders on and just get back in communication with Jesus. And, you know, the Bible says that we live in the world, but we're not of the world. And we need to have that mind of Christ. And, and that mind of Christ is peace and hope and clarity for things that we don't see. He wants to give us discernment. And, you know, as the Bible says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So instead of having faith in the world, we need to really keep, again, with the blinders, we need to pull ourselves back and say, okay, what does the word say about that? Because that is the truth, not what the world says. That's not the truth. Yeah. The truth is what God says, and we have to focus on that. Well, you know, I think one of the things that we talk about in our God Winks uh, books is that we need to keep our eyes open and look for the presence of God everywhere around us. And God winks are those little coincidences that aren't coincidence. They come from God. And, um, and once we start accepting that God is communicating to us at all times, you know, we talk about uh, that, that when I pray, I'm talking to God. When God talks to me, it's a God wink. And so we should always look for those God winks because they're happening to us. They're God communicating to us. And so when we see those, that's when we will be certain that we're not alone. Mm -hmm. We'll be certain that we have a handrail there and God is providing it to keep us safe. Keep our focus on him. You know, as you talk about focus, I know that you as a couple have a, a very beautiful ritual every morning. Yeah. And I got to observe it firsthand, but it's a time when you get together and pray. And yeah. as you share about it, it's not overwhelming. Like anyone could do it. I could do it. Mitch could do it. I want you to tell us about that and how it helps you to focus your day. Tell us how you begin the morning. Well, I... I apart, from, apart from Fox News. Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get up early, 4.30. I start writing, but I, I... And then I keep track of my wife because sometimes she gets up early too. And, uh, and but if, if, if she's still sleeping at 7 a.m., I am there with the tray, with the coffee, with the bagel, and we have breakfast together, and then we pray together. Mm -hmm. And that happens whether it's here in our home or whether we're in Motel 6 somewhere. Mm -hmm. I go find a bagel and coffee, and we have our prayer time together. And that is our board meeting. Yes. It's a board meeting with the chairman of the board, God, mm -hmm. Louise, and myself. And that is, it is a non-negotiable event every single day. And we say to people, we don't need to spend a lot of time at this. In fact, five minutes a day is all we talk about minimally that we ought to be able to do, communicating to God. Five minutes a day is about how much time it takes you to drink a cup of coffee fast. <laughs> so that isn't too much time to spend with God. <laughs> well, I think wow. that, you know, when you skid into that ritual, it becomes so rich that you're going to want two or three cups of coffee. But that's oh. the subject for another day. We're going to come back in just a moment with Squire and Louise. We're going to talk a little bit more about this subject, but also something that's very close to their heart. Stay with us. We're going to be right back. The first time we met was at the bus stop in our neighborhood. I was in sixth grade and he was in seventh grade. Thank God I want to protect her and, and love her and honor her. Uh, all the days of my life. God, I just pray that you uh, give me wisdom. But it was definitely awesome and very, very intimate. It was completely comfortable. You know, like all the cameras, they just kind of dissipated. And it was like she was talking to God about me and I just got to hear their conversation. And that was really, really powerful. I just don't know how I got so blessed. Would you just keep your arms around us and um, keep our hearts tethered together and close together. That's good. God, you're so good. We thank you, God. Yes. Amen. Amen.
You know, as we're talking together, it seems you make prayer seem so natural. Louise, I want you to talk to me about the clip we just watched, uh, 40 Days of Prayer. How do we do it? What's the goal? Uh, what's the expectation? Well, let me just say first off that a lot of couples, especially, don't pray together. And one of the reasons is because they think it's they're going to be either too vulnerable or they don't know how to start or they they think it's going to be this big bridge they have to cross when it's really just a footpath. So what we have tried to do is just ask them to dip their toe in the water, as David and Michaela did, and just say, just pray and see what happens for five minutes a day. And when they did that, we interviewed them after 40 days of praying five minutes a day. And it was spectacular how their marriage was just so much better, how they felt so much closer and closer to God. And so what we want to do is just be the encouragers. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're the couple that prays together. But, you know, when we tell people it's so great to pray together, they say, well, one of the first things is, well, how do you do it? And these are Christian couples, a lot of them. How do you do it? And so we have to kind of take them by the hand and say it's really simple. And so we have started something. It's, it's 40 Day Prayer Challenge, but we're calling it now Pray Stay Challenge mm -hmm. because we want people to pray together and stay together. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. And, and we slide have, in the slide. Yeah, but we have seen, because <laughs> we're doing this with Bailey University, by the way, the first ever empirical study of what happens when two people pray together consistently. And what we're getting with the preliminary studies are just phenomenal. Right on. Well, hey, what let me I jump do? in. Squire, let me just ask you, you know, a person might say, well, even a Christian might say, why would I need to pray with somebody else? I could pray just fine on my own. I know Jesus and I know who he is. I can just talk to him. Why would I want to invite somebody else into that? Your thoughts? Okay, well, first of all, we have to establish that the concept of two people praying together five minutes a day for 40 days to take the pray stay challenge is not our idea. It came from Jesus. We're ripping him off. He's the one who said, That's it. we're two or more gathered together. He's the one who said, we're two agree, and then my Father in heaven will be listening to you. Mm. But not a lot of people have paid attention to Jesus. I, I'm amazed that that uh, how many pastors we did, we come to who say, gee, you know, I hadn't thought about that. Well, that was our issue. We hadn't thought about praying together. But when you do pray together, Mitch, I don't know what happens, how God does it, but it's like taking a sponge and throwing it in the bathtub. It expands. And the, and the, and the sum of prayers between two people is greater than just four. I mean, it's, it, is, it expands. Mm -hmm. And we just notice that our prayers are answered a lot more often when two people pray together. Wow. And uh, there's a story that we wrote about in that book, 40 Day Prayer Challenge, which we're going to be revising and republishing as the Pray Stay Challenge uh, early next year. But the story is about David and Tony. David was told that he had a heart issue, that his heart was only operating at 10 percent and that he had to have a heart transplant. And so they lived all the way down at the bottom of Texas, below Houston, you know, that long tail of Texas, it goes all the way down. And at the very bottom is a little town called McAllen, where in the winter, a cold day is 70. Okay, so <laughs> wow. They got the word that he had to have a heart transplant. They went up to Houston at the DeBakey Health Institute. They told him, well, it's probably going to take about nine months for us to find a donor, if you can find it that fast. There are all these rules and regulations for a donor. And when David and Tony came back, his wife, Tony, she said, David, I believe that we have to pray together every single day. We have to pray together. It's a non-negotiable event in our lives. And so they began to pray together. And as the days and a couple of weeks and three weeks, four weeks went by, they, they were feeling closer to each other. They were feeling more optimistic because the prayer was giving them sustenance. But Tony was getting a little challenged. She said, David, we're praying for somebody to die in order for you to get your heart. Tell you what, why don't we just pray to God to give you complete health, to heal your heart? 
I like that. Well, he wasn't too sure that they should be doing that. And she told a few other friends, and they all kind of rolled their eyes a little bit. But then she told one friend that she even had a side conversation with God. I know you're going to answer my prayer, God, said Tony. But I'd just like to have a sign. Could you make it snow here in McAllen, Texas on Christmas Day? Well, now, when she told her friend uh, who had been with her in kindergarten, he said, Tony, have you ever seen snow? He shook <laughs> her head. He said, the reason why you've never seen snow in McAllen, Texas, is because we haven't had snow in 109 years. And wow. never on Christmas Day. Tony wow. was convinced. And so she just kept on praying. And David kept on praying right along with her. And on Christmas Eve, one of the daughters came home and and uh, and was, they were preparing for Christmas, uh, you know, morning. And David had already gone to bed. And, and so the daughter went over to close that sliding glass door. And so she flipped on the light in the backyard. And she said, Mom, come here. <laughs> and Tony came over, and the, the lawn was covered with snow. The rose blooms had snow on them, and Tony ran out, and her black hair had these white specks all in her hair. And we have a picture of that, and it's so sweet. She's looking up saying, thank you, God, because she knew that was the confirmation. And the next day, the kids got up, and they rolled snowmen and snowballs, and, and, the, and the newspaper said, first white Christmas ever in McAllen, Texas. Nobody what a story. It was Tony who was, who was praying. Went up to the doctor two weeks later. He looked at the report and he said, David, I don't know what happened, but you're going to be living a very long life. Wow. That wow. is a true God wink yes. story. That is the a true answer. evidence of what happened when partnered prayer takes place. Everybody can engage in partnered prayer. Prayer is free. That is so, so powerful. Um, <laughs> that's why you need to move up here, take over for me. <laughs> and you could <laughs> preach that on Sunday morning. So powerful. Louise, when you hear uh, that story, what do you want people to hear? What's, what's the closest thing to your heart as we wrap up today? Well, I want people to know that they can pray together and, and God does answer prayers. Nothing is impossible with God. And that, uh, as Squire said, with two more gathered in my name, you know, he's there. It's like we're, I mean, one couple, after they were praying the 40 days, they felt like, you know, they were praying and, and it was, the girl says, it's like God saying, yeah, kids, yeah, kids, I can hear you. You know, I'm yeah. listening to everything you say. <laughs> and it's really cute because we think of him as our best friend. And, and also when I, when I think about these couples praying and the miracles that happen, I just say, test it, test it. You know, there's a cause and effect. You know, God hears every, his ear is so attentive to every word that we say, every prayer that we utter. And even the ones in our heart that we don't even say out loud, he listens to us and he wants to bless us. Wow. Right on. Well, God listens to us and he wants to bless us. Squire and Louise, just want to say thank you for your time on the program. I know I've been encouraged by the uh, story. How great is that? We thank you guys. Folks at home, want to encourage you. Stick around. Me and Mike are going to be back unpacking some of the things that have just been shared. Stay with us. I know that you had to be just drawn in with that incredible story. And Mitch, as I hear stories where God answers prayer in such powerful mm -hmm. ways, it just encourages me to continue to pray for people, to, to believe that God wants to touch their lives in ways that we can't imagine, in ways that I can't imagine Absolutely. either. Well, yeah, Mike, and that's something I know that it's easy for me to forget to pray for uh, God to actually move in tangible observable ways and just say, God, help me with this. God, help me with that. But I find when I pray specifically, God, will you do this in this person's life? And when I expect God to move and when I pray in accordance with his will, pray things that please him, uh, then I see him move more regularly. And how exciting is that? And I th think the other thing that we need to say is that sometimes we don't see the specific answer to our prayer right away. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps like that man who had the heart condition that Squire right. was talking about. Right. 
But it doesn't mean that God doesn't hear our prayer mm -hmm. because ultimately he's working things out for his good. God has a plan and he's inviting us to participate with it. Absolutely. And I think, Mike, with some prayers, we could say, God, will you do this? Will you do this? And I have been told when you pray uh, to God, expect an answer, but don't always uh, expect the answer really that you would expect. And sometimes we don't even know until looking back later, God did answer that prayer, just not in the way that I wanted him to, but in the way that was best for me and most pleased him. So true. I want to say this to you today as we uh, conclude this segment of our program. And in a moment, I'm going to be doing some teaching from scripture that perhaps you have a need. Maybe you're dealing with cancer today. Someone watching today and you have a heart condition and you're just overwhelmed with that situation or it could be something else. I want to pray with you right now. And I want to encourage you just in faith to say, Lord, I want to receive your healing and your blessing in my life. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you today that you know my situation. I want to thank you that you're inviting me into a dynamic relationship with you. And I bring my request, my need to you today, believing that you heard my prayer. Thank you in Jesus' name. I am Rachel Joy Barbeau, founder of I'mChangingTheNarrative.org. Check it out, I'mChangingTheNarrative.org. Also former national sportscaster, and I've got a book coming out. I'll tell you about in just a moment, but I want to invite you to, to um, recognize the people in your life. Are you ready for this? That spoke to you like a winner before you were even winning. Woo, boy, the people that recognize the winner in you before you were out, outwardly winning. What if today you sent those people a message, a text, a card, hired a skywriter, just kidding on the last part. But if you let them know, hey, thank you for speaking to the winner in me and seeing something in me when I didn't even love myself or I didn't feel like I was winning. And maybe conversely, because somebody did it for you, you could find people in your life, in your workspace, in your church, in your home that you could speak to like a winner even though they aren't winning at this very minute. I'm telling you, it'll revolutionize your life and somebody else's life. And if you love to read, make sure you pick up a copy of Relentless Joy. Uh, Pre-orders matter, and you can grab it wherever books are sold. I would absolutely love if you would grab a copy and would love to hear from you and see how the book affected your life. We've been talking all this week about how God is working out his plan through us. And he's inviting us to be willing partners in the midst of what we're going through. But you know, sometimes as much as we can talk about this, as much as we say, God, I believe it, we feel like we're getting a little rusted out. We're feeling like, you know, Lord, do you really know what you're talking about? Because I'm just starting to feel decrepit. It's been difficult. It's been challenging. And maybe you can relate to this fine piece of machinery. Back in the day, it did a great job. But as we can see now, well, it's a different story and it's here in this field. Let's take it for a moment and we'll just unpack a little bit about what Paul is saying when he says that we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. <clears throat> he goes on in Romans chapter eight, in verse 29, he says these words. I want you to listen carefully because they're not words we use every day. He said, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. If I can jump to the end of the talk today, being conformed to the image of Jesus, I've discovered that it's been the trials, the challenges, the hardships in life more than anything else that conform me to him my battle with sickness. Sometimes it can be a financial situation. Those are the things that make my faith come alive. And I'm saying in the midst of it all, God, I have to choose to trust. Matter of fact, if you don't trust, guess what? You're gonna rust. No other way about it. If you don't trust, you're gonna rust. Listen to what God says here. Those he foreknew. What does that mean? It means that God knew us before we were even born. Psalm 139 talks about that. It says, even before I was created in my mother's womb, you knew all about me. You even knit me together when I was in there. God knew my end from my beginning and my beginning from my end. Nothing has caught him by surprise. 
And I need to rest in that incredible truth because it says we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Paul uses another word here to describe this amazing thing. Not only did God foreknow us, but he predestined us. Predestined us. And the idea of predestination means he marked out with a boundary. The lines were drawn. If you look around the fields out here, you can see the boundary lines. You can see where the vineyards start and where they end. And in the same way, nothing happens outside of the lines in my life that God didn't know. People struggle with that because they say, well, if God knows everything, why do I need to participate? But he invites us into relationship because he wants us to grow strong in the reality that he is with us. He says, I'm inviting you, Michael, to trust me every day. Every day in my relationship with him, with my wife, with my kids, with where I work, with the team of great people I'm surrounded with, he says, I want you to trust me for those situations. And then why? So that I can be conformed to his image. What does it mean to be conformed? It means to take on his shape. You know, when I was a kid, and it's springtime, so as we all know, the, uh, the hockey playoffs are on. But when I was a kid, we used to go out and play ball hockey. And we'd buy these plastic bags, uh, blades. <laughs> Did I say bags and blades? I meant to say plastic blades. That's right. You know, I'm human. I make mistakes. So here's the deal. You had to put them over the heat and bend them. And you could get the curve. And it would shape it. Just like anything else, if you want to shape the bow, you got to put it in water so you can bend the wood. And the idea of being conformed to the image of God is very similar. You see, with that, I come back to the whole principle that God is shaping me and he's conforming me into his likeness. How does that happen? There are three ways. First of all, there's the upward shaping. Am I learning to trust him? That's what Paul, uh, Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 3. In verses 5 and 6, he said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then there's the whole inward part of being conformed to his image. You know what else he says? He challenges us with the question, Am I living for myself or am I living for others? Part of God's plan as he works with me is to say, I want to use you in the lives of others. He wants to do that with you as well person spoke to me recently and he said, I'm clinically depressed. I don't know what my purpose is. Well, part of his purpose is to find people that he can care for. And if you're at a loss to know who you can care for, you call me. I've got a list of about 500,000 people who could use that. You see, the idea of being conformed to the likeness of Jesus, that is a beautiful picture. It's a picture that he wants us to not just think about, but to embrace so that as we learn to trust him, we don't rust. Trusting or rusting, it's your choice.